Hi, welcome to lecture 14. This is the first of two lectures that's going to be focused on the obsessive compulsive spectrum. Um, and today we're going to be talking about body focused repetitive behavior disorders and tick disorders. So the other disorders on the obsessive compulsive spectrum that we'll cover in the next class are um, obsessive compulsive disorder, hoarding disorder and body dysmorphic disorder. The body focused repetitive behavior disorders that we're going to be talking about today and just to talk a little bit about terminology. Um, we're going to talk about tick disorder and also about body focused repetitive behavior disorders, which encompasses right now two recognized diagnoses uh, that have a lot of different names between the two of them. So the first that we'll be talking about is hair pulling disorder, which has also historically been called trichotillomania. Um, the, the root, no pun intended, because hairs have roots, but the root comes from um, Latin for hair pull and then mania is a misnomer as we'll talk about because this is not a disorder that involves a loss of control or mania or psychosis or anything like that. It's not a severe mental illness like some of the other disorders that we've talked about. Uh, but it, it has that old fashioned name. Um, the other disorder that falls under the category of body focused repetitive behavior disorders is excoriation disorder or dermatillomania. But I'm going to try to consistently call it as much as I can skin picking disorder. Because really hair pulling disorder and skin picking disorder are the most descriptive, complex, or simple rather, um, non-stigmatizing terms for these behaviors uh, because they really just describe what they are. Okay, so the first disorder we'll focus on is hair pulling disorder, which involves recurrent pulling of one's own hair that results in noticeable hair loss. So you need to have both of these things. You need to have the pulling behavior and also the resulting hair loss. Uh, it doesn't always have to be as dramatic as this picture demonstrates. This is someone who pulls hair from the head. Often people will pull hair from the face, so eyelashes and eyebrows. And then uh, men who have more body hair, typically, or not typically, but often pull from other parts of their body. Um, in addition to having this recurrent pattern of hair pulling and hair loss, the hair pulling is experienced as compulsive. So it continues despite the person making repeated efforts to stop. And the hair pulling also causes distress and impairment in um, some area of life. Either the hair pulling behavior itself or the resulting hair loss typically causes distress. When it's the hair pulling that causes distress, the distress is coming from the inability to stop. Okay, um, this is just a little snippet from a full length documentary about trichotillomania, uh, hair pulling disorder, sorry, I'm already doing it. Um, and this is gonna be one of your recommended further readings for extra or viewings for extra credit, but I'm just going to play a snippet now. Angela, a computer support specialist in Philadelphia, it's extremely deliberate. The itch is uh, something that a lot of us feel before we actually start pulling. Usually it's a sort of slow burn that grows into a fire. So you start by saying, okay, if I can just get that one that's causing the problem, then everything will be fine. You get what you think is the one. And then, no, that wasn't it. Let me try one more time. And next thing you know, you have a spot. Or next thing you know, you've cleared off the whole, your, you know, your entire eyelash. Or, um, and the same goes for a spot on your head. So I do have a little, like, bald spot right there. I don't know if you can see it from where I pull in these eyelashes are thicker than these because I was working on those more, more recently. So we we'll just hide that a little bit. When my hair is this short and I'm really into pulling, I'll even go and get tweezers. I'm one of the people with trick that pulls from my eyelashes, my scalp, and my groin area. I used to be an eyebrow puller, but somehow I mastered that. So that's one thing down. <laughs> I can't really say what starts it off. I just want to see a follicle for some reason. Um, so I pull and I see one and it might be um, only part of a follicle or it might be on a hair that's black or something. And I decide, oh, well, I'll pull another one and see if I happen to find one that's gray or white um, or has a bigger follicle or something like that. That was how much. Okay. So we'll go back to some of the um, the ideas that that were raised in this video when we talk about 
uh, polling styles and polling locations in a bit more detail. But sure, first, I um, going to quickly talk about the other disorder in the body focus repetitive behavior disorder category, skin picking disorder. This is basically the same as trichotillomania, all the same criteria, but instead of recurrent hair pulling that results in baldness, it's recurrent skin picking that results in skin damage. Um, so common areas for skin picking are kind of pictured here. The cuticles and nails are the most common, um, followed by the lips and also um, often the face where people will have broken skin because of um, acne. So rather than a video, I wanted to just read from a blog post um, by someone who keeps, I think, a Tumblr called Diary of a Skin Picker. Skin Picker. So he said, this is a man. He says, my story begins when I was a teenager. I loved to pop my pimples like many other teenagers. I used to enjoy picking them until I could get out the pus or remove evidence of the pimple and just leave a red open sore in its place. But I figured everyone picks their pimples, right? In my 20s, my picking became increasingly worse. I had open sores, extensive scabs, and scars all over my legs for years, and I would never wear shorts even in the summer. I couldn't stop myself from picking, but I managed to stop picking my face for the most part. Picking my skin was my big secret. I was too ashamed to tell anyone. I was too embarrassed to admit I was damaging my own skin. I isolated myself for years. I didn't want to date or have a girlfriend because I thought my skin looked terrible and no one would love me. So trichotillomania and dermatillomania, hair pulling and skin picking, I, I am sorry, um, are actually pretty common disorders. About 2% of the population meets criteria for trichotillomania, which means that they have all of those pieces. They pull their hair, it results in hair loss, they try to stop and can't, and it causes distress. The prevalence estimates for skin picking disorder, dermatillomania, are a little bit higher. Um, and there's also a wider range of estimates. So these estimates come from meta-analyses, which are reviews of empirical papers that use statistical techniques to combine the estimates of prevalence that each of those individual papers comes up with to create a more stable, reliable estimate. So there are meta-analyses for the prevalence of trichotillomania that suggest a 2% prevalence. Because the, the diagnosis of skin picking disorder is newer, it was just added to DSM-5 for the first time, um, the research is newer, the estimates are less reliable, but somewhere between 5 and 10% most likely. Um, and it is very likely to be more common than hair pulling disorder because subclinical skin picking is more common than subclinical hair pulling. Um, and I think we can all relate to that. If you've ever picked your cuticles or picked a scab or popped a pimple, you know that skin picking is common. Um, there is a lot of overlap between these two behaviors. So about 50% of people who have hair pulling also engage in skin picking and vice versa. There's a lot of overlap. Okay, so for these two disorders, there's no gender difference in prevalence. And that's a little different than like anxiety, depression, personality disorders, but more similar in this way to psychosis um, and uh, bipolar disorder in that there are no gender differences. There are differences in phenomenology by gender though, uh, one of which is that hair pulling disorder, we don't know this about skin picking disorder, but hair pulling disorder tends to start earlier in women for whatever reason. Um, the average age of onset for women is early teens, 14 versus late teens for men. There's some evidence that men with hair pulling disorder report less distress than women with hair pulling disorder. And men with hair pulling disorder pull from different sites in their body, which makes sense because men have more options of body hair to pull for the most part. The difference in experiences of hair pulling disorder, especially between men and women, could have a lot to do with societal norms, gender norms, like we talked about in the last lecture. So it might be less impairing for men because it's more socially acceptable for men to shave their heads or not to have full eyelashes or like shaped groomed eyebrows the way that these things are expected of women. On the other hand though, some men are really distressed by baldness and hair loss and women who have hair loss on their scalp might find it or on their face might find it easier to hide the evidence of both pulling and picking with makeup which is more consistent with feminine gender roles um, and hide hair loss with um, wigs, sew-ins, weaves, and hairstyles. Women might have more options for concealing the damage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about proximal risk factors. So risk factors that are associated with the development for the first time of hair pulling and picking behaviors, the conditions that are present during the development of these disorders. 
Um, there's some evidence that people who have hair pulling and skin picking disorders were more likely to have, in the case of skin picking, acne, in the case of hair pulling, dandruff, uh, for both dry skin. Um, another thing that can trigger hair pulling behaviors, not necessarily the onset of hair pulling disorders, is um, differences in hair texture or color, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. I got ahead of myself, sorry. Um, basically having a problem with your skin or hair that directs a lot of attention to it and that might involve a lot of skin and hair grooming, that can trigger the onset of these disorders. Another thing that can trigger the onset of the disorder is um, stress and anxiety. So these are not anxiety disorders. Hair pulling and skin picking aren't part of any anxiety disorder diagnosis. It's not a typical response to stress and anxiety. So it's a standalone behavior, but like all disorders, um, onset and exacerbation can be triggered by stress and anxiety. So comorbidities, these are disorders that are likely, to, disorders and behaviors that are likely to co-occur with hair pulling and skin picking. By far, anxiety and mood disorders are the most common comorbidity, which is not surprising because they're the most common disorders, but there is actually a very high rate of these comorbidities in trichotillomania, especially mood disorders. Um, we know less about comorbidities in skin picking, but the pattern seems to be really similar. So although anxiety doesn't always cause hair pulling and skin picking, it doesn't always contribute to these behaviors, people who pull their hair or pick their skin are much more likely to be anxious and depressed than the general population. There is some evidence for hair pulling that the hair pulling behavior actually is the first psychopathology that people experience. Um, because it typically has that early adolescent onset. And that hair pulling behavior precedes the onset of anxiety or depression. So some people will even attribute their like social anxiety or their depression to the consequences of hair pulling. The fact that they have visible hair loss, the fact that they feel embarrassed or that they are worried about being judged by their peers, or because of um, the efforts that they might go to to avoid anyone noticing their, their hair loss or their skin picking, leading them to isolate themselves like um, the skin picker example described. There's some evidence that people with hair pulling and skin picking disorder have more problems with interpersonal functioning than other people. Um, still way fewer problems with interpersonal functioning than personality disorders. But because these disorders, when someone has them, they can cause feelings of anxiety and sadness, they can lead to social withdrawal, and they can lead to actual social rejection. Um, there's also a lot of shared risk factors between hair pulling and skin picking and interpersonal problems. So things like mood instability, like we talked about with borderline personality disorder, difficulty recognizing emotions, which is an important part of emotion regulation, and just general trait anxiety. So it's basically it's unclear whether the hair pulling and skin picking cause the social problems. Um, we know that social problems can cause stress and that can exacerbate the hair pulling and skin picking, but we don't know if the causality goes in the other direction. A third option is that it's not that either one causes the other, but they're both caused by underlying things like anxiety, mood instability, emotion regulation difficulties. So one thing that's not a comorbidity that I want to make clear is self-injurious behavior or self-harm. So when I treated hair pulling and skin picking a lot, um, I treated it in kids and parents would often be really, really worried and distressed about their kid because they thought that their kid was engaging in non-suicidal self-injury, that they, they were engaging in self-harm. It's really important to know that hair pulling and skin picking are not a form of self-harm behavior. They do cause physical damage, but the goal of the behavior isn't to cause pain. It's not to regulate distress by causing physical pain and it's not um, an effort to get attention for pain. It's maintained by separate processes that we'll talk about during this lecture. So we talked about what are the sort of proximal risk factors for developing these disorders, but what actually triggers a pulling or picking episode? So when we treat this disorder, we talk a lot about pulling episodes or picking episodes. This is one of the ways that we measure severity. How many pulling or picking episodes does someone have in a day? And a pulling episode just refers to like a discrete period of time where you pulled one or more hairs. Often there's a process that goes into it before you actually pull the hair. People will engage in, for example, sensory exploration. It might be visual, where they look for like um, split ends, curly hairs or straight hairs, hairs that are a different color or texture than the rest of their hairs. With skin, they might be looking at 
their face for signs of acne or blackheads, broken or irregular skin, discolored skin, scabs, dry skin. Sensory exploration is often tactile too. People will feel around their scalp for hairs that they want to pull or for hairs that have a different texture. And people will feel around their skin or their cuticles for skin that they, they can pick. So sensory exploration is a big part of the pulling episode and it really often precedes the actual act of pulling or picking. Um, mood can also be a trigger. So as we talked about, anxiety disorders don't cause skin picking or hair pulling, but people who engage in skin picking and hair pulling sometimes use that behavior to try to regulate mood and anxiety. So when people are stressed, when people are experiencing negative emotions, they might engage in body focused repetitive behaviors um, to kind of intentionally regulate that effect and give themselves something else to focus on. Also, when people are really tired or bored and not really thinking or focusing on it. Also, sometimes when people are really concentrating on something else, they'll kind of automatically start pulling or picking without fully realizing it. So those are two different emotional states that can trigger pulling or picking episodes. Um, context often matters. People often um, wait until they're in private to engage in the pulling or picking episode, or if they do a lot of visual exploration, they might do it only in front of a mirror or only with like a really bright light or like a really close up magnifying mirror in the bathroom. Um, people who pull or pick sort of habitually and outside of conscious awareness might be more likely to do it when they're concentrating or when they're working. Um, like, for example, people often people with long hair will like twirl their hair when they're talking um, without really realizing that they're doing it. It's a similar thing. So there are two styles of pulling and picking that I've kind of already been hinting at, but the first one is focused pulling and picking. So this is pulling and picking where there's an urge that the person is aware of that drives them to engage in the behavior. So this is a quote from a patient, um, this uncomfortable feeling just builds and builds until I pull to get rid of it. So that uncomfortable feeling they're describing is an urge. Um, in focused pulling episodes, people are more likely to use sensory exploration, um, intentionally like looking for the right hair or the right spot to pick. So again, a patient said, I feel around my scalp until I find a hair that feels rough or dry. It's hard to explain, but it just feels right. Um, also in focused pulling episodes, like the people in the pictures are doing, um, people will use visual exploration. So they might use tools like tweezers, like the woman in the first video. Um, they might look in the mirror um, in some cases, a focus pulling episode is kind of like a ritual. It's always done in the same way. Um, so the excerpt that I read you earlier from the, the Diary of the Skin Picker blog, he said that he used to enjoy picking pimples until he could get the pus out or remove evidence of the pimple and just leave a red open sore in its place. So he had like a strategy for picking. Um, there was something that he was trying to like accomplish with the picking episode. Focused pulling is intentional. So in addition to being aware of the urge that leads to the pulling behavior, people will init intentionally initiate pulling behavior in order to relieve a negative emotion like anxiety, distress, or boredom. People will often plan ahead to engage in focused pulling or picking episodes and set time aside to do it. Um, because it's intentional and conscious, people are able to do it in secrecy and it, they often do. They don't want people around them noticing that they're doing this. Um, and then often the act of pulling or picking or the act of like finding that right hair is kind of satisfying and it's experienced as pleasurable. So a patient said, I love that feeling when the hair pops out of the follicle, but you might be able to relate more to the feeling of like picking a scab or picking a sunburn. Um, there is just something satisfying sometimes about like finding an irregularity in your skin or hair and like doing something about it for reasons that we'll talk about later in this lecture. So the other style of picking and pulling is automatic picking and pulling. So automatic picking and pulling happens outside of conscious awareness. People do it without realizing it. So one patient told me, I don't even realize I'm doing it until I see the blood from um, picking her cuticles. Often, whereas focus pulling will often start with intentional exploration um, to find hairs or skin that look or feel different. Automatic pulling might start with another movement like um, touching the hair, playing with the hair, or like resting your face on your chin and touching your face. So it'll start without you fully realizing it with another 
um, body focused movement that's not pulling or picking. Automatic pulling and picking episodes tend to happen more when people are tired or bored or when they're concentrating on something else. So this is like happening when your brain isn't really fully turned on or fully engaged or it's fully engaged by something else. Some people will even say that like pulling their eyelashes helps them concentrate. This is something a patient told me. Um, that doesn't mean that she intentionally pulls her eyelashes in order to concentrate, but she realized that when she's really concentrating on something, her hand will kind of automatically go up to her eyelashes and she'll kind of feel them with one hand while she's doing something else. And this motion that she does, this sensory exploration that she's doing outside of her conscious awareness is so associated with concentrating for her that she thinks it helps her concentrate. Um, sometimes automatic pulling is so automatic that it happens like just as someone is falling asleep or even potentially while they're asleep. Um, I had a patient tell me that they didn't know that they were pulling right before bed at night, like right when they got into bed before they fell asleep. And they wouldn't realize it until the next day when they woke up to find hair all over the pillow. Often automatic pulling episodes will start off automatic and then they'll turn into a focused pulling episode when the person realizes what's going on. So an example from a skin picker was um, once I realize I've already pulled up one edge of the scab, which happens automatically, I feel like I can't move on until I pull it off completely. Um, with the patient who feels like pulling her eyelashes helps her concentrate, she starts out doing this automatically, but once she realizes she's doing the behavior is actually when she starts to pull. And although it started off as associated with concentration, once it becomes automatic, it actually takes her focus away from what she's doing. So she actually came into treatment because it was interfering so much with her ability to concentrate on homework. So there's a little bit of data on what types of pulling, like what styles of pulling are more common. So there's episodes of pulling and picking, which are just, like I said, single instances where you engage in hair pulling or skin picking for a discrete period of time. And for different people, episodes can be more likely to be focused or automatic. So people can be said to have a style of pulling or picking where they're pulling and picking is mostly focused or mostly automatic. Um, a minority of people will say that they do both to an equal extent, but these numbers are rough estimates. And basically you can think about it as about half, or sorry, about um, like 35 to 40% are, are mostly focused, 35 to 40% are mostly automatic and a fewer people than that are fully equal. But the important takeaway is that most people who pick and pull engage in both focused and automatic picking and pulling. Picking and pulling styles are just a matter of which one they tend to do more often. Um, for people who do engage in both kinds of pulling and picking, they can end up in a vicious cycle where um, when they initially pull automatically or if they pull automatically, once they realize that it's happened, that leads to feelings of guilt, um, which in turn can trigger a focused pulling episode where they actually engage in pulling or picking in order to regulate feelings of guilt. Um, typically that will lead to a period of intense efforts to stop pulling and picking, but that streak is often broken again by automatic pulling, which then triggers the guilt, which triggers the focus pulling and starts the whole cycle all over again. So this is just one, um, one way that hair pulling and skin picking can look when there's a mix of focused and automatic pulling. I've worked with people whose pulling was almost completely focused, very rarely automatic, or it would like sometimes start as automatic, but always turn focused. It's less common, especially for adults or older kids, for their pulling to be completely automatic where they have no idea they're doing it. But in very little kids, like two, three, four-year-olds, um, their pulling can be 100% automatic and the child might not be aware that they're doing it. So where do pulling and picking uh, disorders come from? So like most disorders that we've, well, every disorder that we've talked about in class, these behaviors have an evolutionary basis. Um, most psychological disorders are just adaptive behaviors that have gone too far or that are happening in inappropriate contexts. And pulling and picking are not an exception to that. So the grooming hypothesis of body-focused repetitive behavior disorders is that these, are be these behaviors are grooming that has gone too far, grooming that's run amok. So grooming is important to the survival of most, basically all animal species. It's really important for organisms to be able to clean their bodies to make it less likely that they'll get infections. 
Um, so because it's so important to preserve life, it's pretty universal to all animal species. But the most familiar manifestations of grooming and the ones that are the most analogous to hair pulling and skin picking are um, mammals grooming. So if you've had a house pet, like a cat or a dog, you've seen lots of grooming, probably more from your cat than your dog. Um, but all mammals do this up to primates who engage in social grooming where they'll groom each other. Most behaviors that are this necessary for survival are subjectively experienced as pleasurable. We know this as humans because we can say it's pleasurable, but we can also infer that it's pleasurable for other animal species. So for example, all animals seem to enjoy the act of eating. It's rewarding, it's positive, it's fun, it creates positive affect. Um, humans enjoy other biologically necessary behaviors like sex, and humans will say that grooming is pleasant. People can find it soothing to do their hair, do their makeup, take a relaxing shower, and people also say that they find it soothing and relaxing to pull their hair and pick their skin. Grooming in animals has a sensory component that's similar to the sensory exploration that happens in pulling and picking episodes. So animals uh, will search their skin for irregularities like bumps or different feeling spots on their skin because that could be parasites. It could be like a tick or a flea on your skin. Um, animals will also lick broken skin as a way of keeping their wounds clean. So grooming and feeling tactilely for irregularities in skin or hair is an adaptive behavior in animals. It helps them keep themselves clean and safe. In animal species, grooming behavior also seems to be tied to emotions. So in primates, it's a social behavior. Monkeys and apes will groom each other as a way of um, bonding and maintaining friendships. And animals appear sometimes to use grooming as a self-soothing behavior. You'll notice like if your dog or cat is stressed, they might engage in more frequent, more frequent grooming than when they're um, busy doing something else. So animals um, seem to use grooming as a way to soothe themselves. We, uh, another piece of support for the um, grooming hypothesis is that there's evidence for problematic grooming behaviors in animals as well as in humans. So in animals, this behavior is known as over grooming and it's pretty common. Similar to hair pulling and skin picking, which often will start with um, acne or dandruff or dry skin. Um, problematic grooming in animals often begins with a skin condition or an injury, which is adaptive for the animal to pay attention to and groom. But then once that injury is healed or the skin condition, the allergy has gone away, the grooming behavior continues, like it's taken on a life of its own. Um, grooming in animals is also, sorry, over grooming in animals is also associated with things like chronic stress and chronic understimulation. So birds that don't get enough social interaction or intellectual stimulation will sometimes pull off all their feathers or they'll do it when they're stressed. Um, dogs that are stressed or anxious will sometimes over groom spots of their coat or they'll like chew on um, skin irregularities until they bleed. So this is an example of a dog wearing pants to stop it from over grooming itself. Um, Okay, so um, as discussed in some of the previous slides, hair pulling and skin picking is often done to relieve a negative emotion, um, including boredom. Being bored and understimulated is aversive, so people are motivated to do things to relieve that sensation. But other negative emotions that pulling and picking can relieve are things like anxiety, sadness, boredom, guilt. So behaviors that are done because they help an organism or a person escape from a negative emotion or a negative state are known as negatively reinforced behaviors. They're reinforced by escape. They're reinforced by a negative, by getting away from something. But like I talked about in the grooming slides, um, hair pulling and skin picking behaviors are also satisfying. People who do it describe it as pleasurable. Um, it feels good, it feels engaging. It's not just escaping from a negative, feeling or sensation, but it's also adding a positive feeling or sensation, which means that it's positively reinforced too. So pulling and picking is reinforcing both because it helps escape from negative situations, or sorry, negative sensations and negative emotional states, and it's positively reinforced because it feels good and it makes um, organisms feel satisfied. So because um, people with the disorder will differ in the kind of reasons for pulling and picking, 
how focused the pulling and picking is, whether it's done in response to anxiety, stress, or boredom, whether it's done um, like Angela, the woman in the first video said, because it feels really good to see a follicle. That's positive reinforcement. She doesn't really describe it as something that she does to get rid of anxiety or depression. She does describe it though as something that she does to get rid of an urge. Um, she describes this urge as kind of like a sensory feeling that's building up inside of her. This is something that a concept that we'll talk about more with ticks and then even more with um, OCD. But that sort of almost sensory feeling of urgency inside your body, that's also something that we're motivated to get rid of. Um, so all of these behaviors, when a person is aware of an urge and doing it to get rid of the urge, that's also negative reinforcement. So the takeaway, though, is that different people with the disorder have different amounts of negative and positive reinforcement in their disorder, depending on why they pick and pull, like what emotions prompt them to, and what they enjoy about pulling and picking. And then also within the same individual, different pulling and picking episodes can have different types of reinforcement. So that makes the treatment of this disorder kind of extra complicated uh, because these behaviors are both negatively and positively reinforced. And that's not really true of a lot of the behaviors we've talked about so far in this class. So for example, we've talked a lot about how escape and avoidance is negatively reinforced in anxiety disorders because it helps people feel less anxious. Um, there's nothing positive though about avoiding. People don't enjoy the act of avoiding or escaping from a situation. So avoidance and anxiety disorders is only negatively reinforced. Um, the fact that there's these two kinds of reinforcement can make this a difficult disorder to treat. So this figure is just kind of an example of negative reinforcement of pulling and picking. I think this is a, a pulling study, but the same goes for picking too. So participants were asked um, how bored they were before a pulling episode, how bored they were during a pulling episode, and how bored they were after a pulling episode. And bored is just one example of a negative emotion that people will pull and pick to relieve. And as you can see, the level of boredom decreased once the pulling episode started. So people are motivated to escape from boredom. Pulling accomplishes that. So pulling is negatively reinforced. There's also an increase in positive emotions happening too. So the feeling of being calm, the feeling of being relieved. And these, things, these are examples of positive reinforcement because these are emotional states that people want to get into. These are um, ways that they feel better before, after pulling than they did before. So this is an example of a pulling episode that's both negatively and positively reinforced. Um, other emotions that tend to change, other negative emotions that people tend to escape from during pulling episodes besides boredom are feelings of tension, feeling sad, feeling angry, feeling anxious. The only negative emotion that's known to increase after pulling episodes rather than decrease is guilt. So typically what will happen, going back to that vicious cycle, when people engage in focused pulling episodes, they're doing it to get rid of, rid of feelings like boredom, sadness, anxiety. Um, and they, they do, pulling accomplishes that. But after the pulling episode, they're still left with negative feelings of guilt. So if that's a negative feeling that they might not have had before. In a way, you can kind of think of it as replacing the other negative feelings. So this is why hair pulling and skin picking are distressing. Um, people typically feel bad about it, they don't want to do it. Um, it's enjoyable while it's happening or it feels really reinforcing while it's happening because it's helping you escape from these negative feelings. But once it's over, people often feel really guilty about it and really bad about it. Okay, so just like um, everything we've talked about, body-focused repetitive behaviors uh, exist on a spectrum and they're pretty common in the non-clinical population. So hair pulling for like pleasure gratification or to relieve an urge. So not hair pulling for cosmetic reasons like plucking your eyebrows, but hair pulling that is negatively and positively reinforced is pretty common in the non-clinical population, at least more common than trichotillomania. So somewhere between six and 7% of people will do this from time to time. Um, and again, like anyone who has Pulled, maybe pulled out a hair because it had a weird texture or like enjoys the feeling of washing your hair and seeing all the hair come out in the shower. Like these are pretty common experiences and you can think of it as that like sort of feeling of satisfaction and pleasure that comes from removing these hairs probably has evolutionary roots in our ancestors who 
needed to do the, these kinds of things to preserve their health. So needed to like groom their, their coats to get the dead fur and skin out so that they didn't get infections and so that they would be more appealing to mates. So skin picking non-clinically is even more common than hair pulling um, to the extent that a majority of people do this. And again, the most common non-clinical form of skin picking is definitely people picking at their nails and cuticles. Also things like picking sunburns, picking scabs, and picking acne. But hair pulling and skin picking are not the only body focused repetitive behaviors that have a root in grooming. So nail biting is another one that's really common. Estimates suggest that it's a little bit less common than skin picking, but it's still quite common. Um, cheek and lip biting has a similar subclinical prevalence to hair pulling. And this is when people um, use their teeth to pull at the skin on their lips or inside their mouth. Um, other body focused repetitive behaviors that are experienced in many of the same ways as hair pulling and skin picking, but again, are not associated with DSM-5 diagnoses are like playing with hair, twirling hair, touching hair, smoothing hair, and touching your face. And these behaviors are pretty much universal. Everyone does them. But in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about ways that they're actually analogous to hair pulling and skin picking. So some people have argued that because hair pulling and skin picking are not the only grooming related repetitive body focused behaviors that people do, we should actually just create an umbrella diagnosis like body focused repetitive behavior disorder that can encompass recurrent, hard to control, distressing and physically damaging hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting and lip biting all within the same umbrella with the same basic criteria that the behavior um, be recurrent that it cause physical damage, so hair loss, nail loss, skin lesions, that it be experienced as compulsive and hard to control, so people try to stop and can't, and that it cause distress. So there are a lot of similarities between um, the phenomenology, so the experience of nail biting and lip biting and hair pulling and skin picking. One is that nail biting, just like hair pulling and skin picking, has this focused versus automatic dichotomy. Um, a majority of people who bite their nails say that their nail biting is sometimes automatic and a majority say that it's sometimes focused. So similar to hair pulling and skin picking, these circles overlap. So most people engage in both automatic and focused nail biting. There's a lot of overlap among the body focused repetitive behaviors. So like I said, 50% of people who pull their hair also pick their skin and vice versa. But somewhere between 25 and 30% of people who pull their hair also bite their nails and lips to an impairing degree. So again, 40 to 50% of us bite our nails, but of people with trichotillomania, so clinically significant hair pulling disorder, um, 25 to 30% also bite their nails and their lips in a clinically significant way. Just like hair pulling and skin picking, there's a childhood onset and the disorder is chronic if it's not treated. So these behaviors are very, very hard to stop. It can be focused or automatic. Um, it, this might seem a little bit weird, but even nail biting can be experienced as positively reinforcing. So about 50% of people who bite their nails say that it's enjoyable, that they like doing it. Just like hair pulling and skin picking, as we'll talk about more in another couple slides, um, Nail biting and lip biting are more common in people with anxiety disorders, with OC spectrum disorders in general. Um, just like hair pulling and skin picking, people tend to do this more in certain states than others, and people tend to bite their nails and lips more when they're concentrated, when they're stressed, when they're tired, um, when they're anxious. So the prevalence of hard to control and distressing nail biting and lip biting is really similar to the prevalence of hair pulling and skin picking, somewhere between 3 and 11%. So again, all of these body focused repetitive behavior disorders are falling in this like two to 10% roughly prevalence range. Just like hair pulling and skin picking, there are no gender differences in the prevalence of nail biting and lip biting. Um, but okay, so nail biting and lip biting, maybe you can see how that's, it, it's deviant technically because, well, I mean, not everyone does it, possibly 50% of people do it. So whether it's deviant is questionable, but touching your hair and touching your face is completely universal. So is this really a body focused repetitive behavior disorder? Is it really the same thing? And of course, 
no, I would say that it's not a disorder unless it causes impairment. Um, most of us touch our faces a lot, but most of us are not really bothered by doing that to the extent that most of us haven't really made a lot of efforts to stop. Um, but even though it's not a disorder, it is a body focused repetitive behavior. So it has a lot of the same characteristics as hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting, lip biting. Face touching and hair pulling are in the same spectrum under the same umbrella. We're more likely to touch our faces and hair when we're anxious or stressed, when we're bored, when we're tired, or when we're concentrating. Or I would like to add, and this is something that comes up when you're treating these disorders, when you talk about hair pulling or skin picking, you have to be really careful when you're with a patient not to start doing these things yourself. Whenever I'm talking about trichotillomania or hair pulling disorder, I notice that I touch my hair a lot. Um, so in addition to being triggered by anxiety, stress, boredom, all these negative emotions, these behaviors definitely can be triggered by just talking about them. Um, and that's also really true of tics, as we'll talk about later. Hair pulling and face touching can be self-soothing behaviors. So when people are shocked or upset, they'll often touch their mouths, um, cover their faces. There is a self-soothing element to that. People who touch or twirl their, twirl their hair when they're nervous, they kind of are doing it as a way to calm themselves down and help themselves regulate. So it's self-soothing, just like hair pulling and skin picking. Similarly, it's related to grooming. Um, and face touching and hair pulling, or sorry, face touching and hair touching are also often part of like the pulling and picking ritual or they're part of the pulling and picking process. So hair pulling will often start out with hair touching. Skin picking often starts out with face touching. Just like hair pulling and skin picking, they can be focused or automatic. Um, I would say that these behaviors are more often automatic than hair pulling and skin picking. Um, especially face touching. It's that's something that we do all the time without even realizing we're doing it. And just like all body focused repetitive behavior disorder behaviors, touching your hair and touching your face, if you've ever tried to stop or cut down because someone told you that as a woman with long hair, playing with your hair is unprofessional or because you noticed that you were getting acne from touching your face so much, it's really hard to stop these things. They are very ingrained habits. And because they're both probably positively and negatively reinforced, they're really hard to stop. So as an example of that, obviously during the coronavirus, it's best that we all avoid touching our faces. But this is a video from the really early days of the coronavirus shutdown um, when public health officials were just starting to explain to us what we needed to do to keep ourselves safe from coronavirus, which involves not touching your face and not putting your fingers in your mouth. And this video is just like a funny example of how difficult it is to stop and control these behaviors, even when you're really trying to. Well, we're always saying the common sense of washing your hands, not touching your face. We're looking at every way individuals come into the country, not just through the... Right. Through the One of the key parts to preventing transmission is washing your hands and not touching your face. You know, there's a, there's a lot of folks that are trying to ask themselves, do I need a mask? I think these are very important things. Working hard, not to touch your face. And everyone have to fill out their bill directly to CDC with that information. I've been looking around the room here. I can't tell you the number of you who put your hands to your face in the last uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. I want to know how many of them are from. Here are some of the things about washing your hands and not taking, touching your mouth and your your nose and your eyes. Can you tell me why it took five days? The value of hand washing and using sanitizing gels to, if you get the virus on your hands, eliminate it before it finds a way. Don't touch your face. I, uh, my, my kids are so sick and tired of me saying if they scratch the face, don't touch your face. That's how viruses get. Okay. So yeah, it's a hard habit to break. Start. Okay, so getting back to body-focused repetitive behavior disorders and away from the full spectrum of body-focused repetitive behaviors, trichotillomania and skin picking disorder are disorders because they, in part, can cause a lot of um, impairment and complications. So alopecia is just another word for hair loss. Sometimes the hair loss that's caused by recurrently pulling your hair can be permanent. Um, people who overplucked their eyebrows might know this, but um, sometimes that can cause physical damage to the hair follicle that makes it hard for the hair to grow back, or it can change the texture when the hair grows back. 
um, both hair pulling and skin picking, but especially skin picking can cause skin infections uh, from open wounds. If you use your mouth to pull your hair, um, people who pull their arm hair will often use their mouth um, or bite your nails or pick your skin. That can cause you to ingest bacteria or viruses for the same reason that you shouldn't touch your face. Um, skin picking especially can cause scarring and a really rare complication, um, but still very significant complication of hair pulling disorder is what's known as a trichobezoar. So before getting into this, I should also mention that for some people, eating the hair that they pull out is part of the hair pulling process. It's part of the ritual. This is known as trichophagia, which is from the Latin root for eating hair. Um, for some people, it's just part of the ritual. So some people will engage in what's called post pulling sensory exploration, where they will like feel the hair between their fingers, they'll look at the follicle, they'll often put the hair to their lips to feel it with their mouth. Sometimes they'll bite off the follicle and sometimes they'll eat the whole hair. So a bezoar is, a trichobezoar is a mass of hair that gets stuck in the stomach. So human hair is resistant to digestion and because of the texture of the hair, it um, is resistant to being moved through the stomach by digestive contraction. So your stomach is always contracting, um, but because the hair is so long and thin, it tends to get like stuck to the stomach wall and not move through your digestive system. So over time, hair can just build up and build up um, until it gets to the point where it starts to cause things like abdominal pain, loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. And by the time it gets to this point, it's usually really large um, because you can, you can have a lot of stuff in your stomach without it getting in the way until it starts like filling up your stomach too much or blocking the, the exit to your stomach and into your small intestine. Um, trichobezoars are most common in young children and in teenage girls. And that's most likely just because um, young children are more likely to eat their hair than older people. And teenage girls are more likely to have longer hair. So the treatments for trichobezoars, because they're often really large when they're caught, um, typically they have to be surgically removed. And this can sometimes be done laparoscopically, um, but often because the bezoar can't be broken up in the body, it has to be an open surgery. So that's what this is, a, a scar in someone's abdomen right over their stomach where the bezoar was removed. Um, less common is gastroscopic removal where a um, gastroscope is put down someone's nose or the back of their throat and into their stomach and then used to pull the hair out. Um, a kind of weird but actual treatment is um, using Coca-Cola. So this might be done like enterally, which is where you put a tube in someone's nose and put Coca-Cola in through the tube or actually inject it into the stomach. Um, Coca-Cola has weird acidic properties that make it able to dissolve hair. So this is a link to a um, DIY video of how to use Coke to unclog a drain. So the thing with trichobezoars is that if the trichotillomania, the underlying hair pulling disorder, isn't treated, um, there's a really high rate of recurrence. If someone eats enough hair on a regular enough basis to cause this, they're likely pulling a lot and it's not something that's going to go away on its own. So how does trichotillomania go away? How do we treat it? The treatment of choice for trichotillomania is a cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but it has its, its own special name, habit reversal training. And this is more broadly a treatment for all body focused repetitive behavior disorders. It actually started out as a treatment for nail biting. So it has three components. The first component is awareness. So this means becoming totally conscious of what your triggers are for picking and pulling. Are you more likely to do it when you're tired? Are you more likely to do it under bright lights? Are you more likely to do it in the morning or at night? Are you more likely to do it when you're stressed? People usually have like a general idea of this, but um, in therapy, we encourage them to track every single polling episode to gather as much data about it as they can. Um, this is also the way that we track progress in treatment. So throughout treatment, people will track their polling episodes and the number of hairs that they pulled or um, the number of times they picked their skin in a picking episode. Um, this is the way that we know the treatment is working because those numbers should go down. The next part after raising awareness and helping a person understand their triggers and possibly start to avoid them is stimulus control. So stimulus control has to do with either avoiding your triggers for pulling. So knowing that you always pull when you're stressed. So either trying to like work on your stress management, or if you know that you only pull in private or only pull automatically, making sure that when you are stressed out, you're like around someone who knows that you're doing this and can let you know that you're pulling 
um, or that you're in a situation where you know that you wouldn't pull like at work. Um, and then another, the other manifestation, sorry, the other form of, sim of stimulus control is doing things that physically make it impossible to pull or pick. So sometimes people will go so far as to like wear gloves all the time so that they can't use their fingernails to pull their hair or they can't do that sensory exploration. Um, sometimes for, pe for certain people wearing nail polish will help them reduce the pulling or picking urge because they don't want to mess it up. Um, for example, for nail biting, there are like bad tasting nail polishes that are sold that make it, that help both raise awareness because sometimes it's automatic and also make it physically difficult or less desirable to do. Um, other forms of stimulus control could be things like wearing a hat, um, wearing your hair in braids if you're, if that's not a way that you pull, um, wearing makeup. For some people, wearing mascara makes it harder to pull their eyelashes. Um, or things like wearing clothes, like for people who, for example, I had a patient who picked the skin on her back when she was concentrating by putting her hand under the neck hole of her shirt. For her, stimulus control looked like wearing a turtleneck or wearing a scarf to block that access to her back. Um, and then the last component is competing responses. So this is really important because trichotillomania is positively reinforced. Some people just really need something else to do to help satisfy that urge to pick or pull without totally giving into the urge. So you can think of it as just kind of something to do to keep your hands busy and to help you manage that uncomfortable urge and ride it out. So people will often do things that just like keep them busy and distracted like using fidget toys or when they know they're at high risk for pulling, try to do something else that takes up their concentration and uses their hands like playing video games or crafting. Um, people who like use their mouth to pick and pull or who eat their hair might do something like chew gum um, to, again, keep their mouth busy, or that could help with like lip biting and cheek biting. Um, or if you just have a really strong urge and you really want to reach up and touch your hair, doing something like sitting on your hands or clenching your fists as a way of just physically blocking yourself from doing that behavior as you ride out the urge. So in class, um, the activity for Thursday is going to be trying HRT on yourself. Um, so coming up with a plan to raise your awareness of how often you touch your face, creating stimulus control techniques to help um, block or make face touching more difficult and developing competing responses to replace the urge to touch your face. Okay, so that was body focused repetitive behavior disorders. I'm gonna just touch on tick disorders briefly and then we have a video from our uh, guest conversation, guest lecturer talking about how tick disorders and body focused repetitive behavior disorders are similar and different from each other. Okay, so tick disorders. Ticks are defined by the DSM as a sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic motor movement or vocalization. So what they mean by non-rhythmic is that they tend to only happen once or if they happen in clusters, they don't happen at the same repeated interval. And this is in contrast to um, stereotypies or self-stimulating behaviors that are common for people with autism or people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and what stereotypies look like is repetitive motion. So like doing this with your hand is an example of a stereotypy. Um, nodding your head repeatedly like this or rocking as an example of a stereotypy. It's repeated, it's um, rhythmic, it's kind of like a metronome. You could like count to it. Um, also, rhythmic motions can be something like a tremor or a stutter. Um, they're all repetitive. So ticks are typically like isolated behaviors, or if they occur in clusters, the cluster, the occurrences are not spaced at regular intervals. So there's sort of three tick disorders that really are all the same disorders. So these are not really that meaningful distinctions. They just kind of describe the presentation. So a motor tick disorder involves a single or multiple motor tick. Um, a vocal tick disorder involves a single or mul multiple vocal tick. And Tourette's disorder involves both motor and vocal ticks. And in Tourette's, the motor and vocal ticks can occur at the same time. Um, noises like vocalizations and motor movements can be part of the same complex tick. Or anyone who has ever had vocal ticks and then separately has ever had motor ticks actually meets criteria for Tourette's disorder. So I think one of, um, one of the misconceptions about ticks that I often encountered with patients was 
there was a perception that Tourette's disorder is more serious in some way than motor or vocal tic disorders. And it really isn't. People with Tourette's disorder might actually have fewer separate tics than someone with motor or vocal tic disorder. Someone with Tourette's disorder who has one motor tic and one vocal tic probably has a less severe illness than someone with motor tic disorder who has 17 motor tics and does them constantly. There's also a stereotype about Tourette's disorder that it involves shouting out profanities or blurting out um, the like things from the top of your head. Tics that are full words or full sentences are relatively uncommon. Uh, most vocal tics are just vocalizations. So anything that makes a noise, like clearing your throat, clicking your tongue, whistling, grunting, squeaking, all of these are way more common than tics that involve actually saying words. And tics that involve saying bad words, which is known as corporalalia, are pretty rare. They do happen, but the more typical vocal tic in either vocal tic disorder or Tourette's is not a word, it's just a sound. So this is just an example of an assessment for tic disorder. These are parents and a, a young child describing the child's tics to a physician. So he's doing the tick while they're talking about it. He's jerking his head like that. Okay. So if you watch this full video, I'm definitely not endorsing this treatment. I've never heard of it. I'm not sure what it is. This is just a random doctor's YouTube channel. Um, but that was an example of a typical tick patient, a young child, often a boy, with just one relatively simple tick. Um, so the, the difference between simple and complex ticks has to do with, um, well, how simple or complex they are, basically. A simple tick is just a tick that is a single sound or a single movement. So that young boy was an example of a simple head, head nodding tick. Going like this is one movement. Um, a common single vocal tick is something like clearing your throat. Um, a complex tick is two or more connected sounds or movements. So if someone cleared their throat while nodding their head, that would be a complex motor vocal tick. Um, if someone blinked and looked up at the same time, that's two motor movements. It's a complex motor tick. So this is an adult demonstrating her complex motor and phonic ticks. Hi, I'm Olivia Henninger and I have Tourette's. Okay, so that involved both motions and sounds in the same tick. And although it, it was like sort of a burst of movements and sounds, all of that was one tick. So it's, it can be a little hard to distinguish it from stimming, self-stimulating behavior or stereotypies. But if you think about ticks as either simple or complex, that whole sequence that she just did was a single tick. If she did that, sequence of movements in a rhythmic way, like over and over and over in the same way at repeated intervals, that might be more like a stereotypy. You're not the most attractive things in the world. Imagine going through Starbucks and sounding like a mockingbird. That's a, it's a pretty common occurrence for me, going into Starbucks and then I start whistling five or six different tunes. Nothing particularly good sounding. Uh, a lot of Peter and the Wolf. I apparently really like that song. I mean, I do really like that song, but apparently my ticks like it too. Um, There it is. That's it. That's it. That's, that's Peter and Wolf. So some people will say, um, just like I was talking about how talking about hair pulling always makes me realize how much I'm touching my hair. Um, 
people who have ticks will often say that talking about ticks triggers the urge. It makes it more likely that they'll have the urge to do ticks. And if you look at the comment section in this YouTube video, you have a bunch of people saying that it triggered their ticks. Okay, so whereas trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder, and skin picking disorder usually start in adolescence, which is still a relatively early onset, tick disorders have an even earlier onset. Um, the DSM lists the mean age of onset as between four and six years old. Clinically, most of the patients I treated came in for treatment when they were around eight or nine years old, but often they had had a couple years of more minor ticks and they came in for treatment when the ticks got worse. Tick disorders usually begin with a single tick. Um, and then typically the developmental course is that something that starts with a single tick will, more ticks will be added on over time or simple ticks might turn into complex ticks. An interesting pattern that's common to ticks is that the first tick is also something on the head or face. So or often something in the head or face. So like it might be a throat clearing tick or an eye blinking tick or a looking tick where people will look up. Um, those are some of the most common kinds of ticks or a head jerk. But ticks often will start with the head and then move down the body as the disorder progresses and as ticks become more complex. The prevalence of tick disorders and Tourette's in childhood is around 2%. Um, it's more common in boys than in girls, anywhere from two times more common to four times more common. Um, it is something that many people do grow out of, unlike trichotillomania. Um, so the prevalence is lower in adults and onset in adulthood is really rare. When it happens, it's often related to a neurological condition like a stroke. So a question that a lot of people have about ticks is, are ticks really psychological? A lot of people think of ticks as something that's more neurological. It's more like brain-based. It has more to do with like a specific problem with your brain. That distinction is really hard to make. I hope that this class has kind of illustrated that already. Um, there are neurological and physiological components to all of the behaviors that we've talked about. Um, even though I think we'd all agree that anxiety and depression are like prototypical psychological problems, they all have a neural basis and ticks are no exception. But in practice, the field actually does treat ticks kind of differently and I think that that does a disservice to patients, um, especially children. Um, because tick disorders are seen as these neurological conditions and not as behavioral or psychological, they're often treated by neurologists or psychiatrists or sometimes even just general physicians, pediatricians. The way that ticks are described in the DSM, I think doesn't help with this. The DSM describes them as involuntary. And I would argue from my clinical experience and theoretical like understanding of what tick disorders are that that's just not true. And our guest speaker is going to speak to that a little bit more. Um, but the typical medications that are prescribed for tick disorders are atypical antipsychotics. That's actually the most common class of drug. And that's really scary to see in a little kid. Um, these are really heavy duty drugs. And as we talked about in the bipolar lecture, antipsychotics and mood stabilizers um, were overprescribed to children for misdiagnosed childhood onset bipolar disorder. It's definitely a concern for me that um, these things are overprescribed for children with ticks. It's not to say that these kids don't have ticks, but heavy duty medications like this might not be necessary to treat them. A, because not all people with ticks are bothered by them. Plenty of people have ticks, don't experience impairment, don't meet criteria for tick disorder, but also because there are effective behavioral treatments that work for ticks. Okay, so other, um, other classes of medication that are prescribed for ticks include alpha-2 agonists, which these are drugs that were initially developed as blood pressure medications, but they seem to work for like ticks and anxiety. Um, one of the most common used for ticks is called guanfacine. And then Botox injections are a treatment for ticks in adults. Uh, that basically just blocks the physical ability to do the tick. So like if someone has um, like a grimacing tick where they like make motions with their mouth, they would get Botox injections in those muscles that they need to make those motions and that would make it hard to do. So as you can see, I'm not a huge fan of medical treatments for ticks, mostly because I think they're unnecessary because most people respond to psychotherapy for ticks. And just like we talked about with competing responses for trichotillomania, the psychotherapy for ticks is based on the idea that these are urge-driven behaviors. So ticks are not involuntary. 
they might be subjectively experienced as involuntary in the same way that when you have an itch, you involuntarily scratch it. It's just the automatic thing that you do. Just because the res behavioral response to feeling that itch is so overlearned that you don't even have to think about it before you do it, doesn't mean that you don't have a choice about doing it. You can suppress the urge to itch something that itches. You can even suppress the urge to sneeze or cough, even though, again, those are physical sensations that we have a single behavioral response to that we don't even have to think about. We don't even have to choose how we respond to that sensation. It feels like our body is doing it for us, but really that's just a habit kicking in. And most of us have had reasons to suppress the urge to scratch an itch or the urge to sneeze or cough at an inopportune time. So you know that it's possible. So the urge to tick, which is also referred to as a premonitory urge, and I'm just introducing that terminology because the guest speaker uses it. The urge is involuntary. The urge is outside of conscious control. And that's not any different than the involuntary emotional experiences that happen with anxiety and depression. So for example, in a panic attack, the panic is also involuntary. People don't choose to feel that way. But the behavioral response to that feeling is under voluntary control. People can choose not to tick, people can choose not to avoid when they're having a panic attack. So the treatment for tick disorders is the same as the treatment for trichotillomania. It's habit reversal training with competing responses. And in trichotillomania, the competing responses are often things that kind of replace the urge. So if I am a skin picker and I wanna stop picking the skin on my hands, something I might do to replace that urge is put Elmer's glue on my hands and peel that off instead. It's kind of giving into the same urge, but in a less destructive way. And that will often be like a gateway behavior that we use to help patients um, eliminate the physically damaging aspects of skin pulling and hair picking while they work on learning to resist the urge. But the ultimate goal for both of these treatments, and that's especially important for ticks, is just learning to ride out the urge. So ticks are driven by this involuntary sensory sensation that out of habit, people relieve temporarily by ticking. So someone with a head jerking tick will say that they do it because they have this uncomfortable feeling in their neck that they need to move their head. And when they move their head, that feeling goes away. So that tick is negatively reinforced by getting rid of the urge. But urges, just like fear and anxiety, they don't last forever. So if you don't give into the urge, if you don't relieve it by doing the behavior, the urge will eventually go away on its own. Um, and that's what this figure illustrates. There's this concept of surfing the urge that's used in basically every behavior that's um, voluntary and negatively reinforced. Um, so like hair pulling and skin picking, but also drinking, binge eating. Um, people experience an urge to engage in these behaviors and what they learn is that if they resist the urge, it will eventually, it'll increase in severity and intensity for a while, but then eventually it will peak and go down. Okay, so this is the end of this lecture. This was a shorter one. Um, we're just going to have a few minutes of an excerpt, excerpt, excerpt um, of this week's guest conversation video, which is a conversation with Dr. Hillary Kratz. Um, Hillary and I went to grad school together, um, and we also worked in the same clinic treating ticks and trichotillomania and skin picking disorder. So she's an expert in habit reversal training for trichotillomania and in CBT for uh, tick disorders. And in the excerpt from the conversation with her, she's going to be talking about some of the differences and similarities between ticks and body-focused repetitive behavior disorders. I think a big similarity is that idea of that negative reinforcement cycle, that, that um, premonitory urge with like an eye blink, it might be like a tickle in your eye or twitch. If it's a, a throat clearing, you might hear a tickle in the back of your throat or so forth. Um, and when you do that tick, there's that same scratching mosquito bite thing, that the more that you tick, the more it's reinforcing the urge. So I think I would think about that as the biggest similarity. I think probably the biggest difference is that appetitive piece that I talked about. So um, with the FRBs, there is often, usually, almost always, like at least some pleasurable aspect to it. Um, but trick is really sort of like feels a lot more sort of purely physiologically driven. Okay, so two things. I forgot to introduce the term appetitive. Appetitive just means positively reinforced. So it's anything that feels good or that we enjoy. Um, she also, I do this all the time because trick is the, the 
term that we use for trichotillomania with patients, and it sounds a lot like tics. So she was saying that tics are involuntary, not trick. And it's annoying. Like people don't want to do the tic. There's no part of it that feels particularly pleasurable, except for maybe a little bit of a relief the way you would get if you scratch an itch, but it's not like scratching it just a super fun or um, sort of engaging in any way. Neither of them are caused by anxiety or caused by boredom or caused by sadness, but both of them you tend to see a lot more of in times of either, either high intense negative emotion or sort of um, too little activation. So um, the trick I often think about it is like it's getting toward homeostasis. So you may have somebody who is um, bored and like, or sometimes I hear clients say like, I feel body boredom. Like, my mind is fine, but I just feel like I need to do something with my hands and they end up picking or pulling. Um, and with trick often, and with trick disorder, sorry, we often also see um, boredom or anxiety or um, sometimes other negative emotions trigger the tick. With trick, we also see the relationship between things like anxiety and depression go both ways. So um, yes, people may pull more during times that they're down or anxious, but we also know that trick is a really tough thing to have, um, especially in an appearance-focused world. And so that also, sometimes you see the trick come first, and then the anxiety and depression. We never really know, and everything's multiply determined. Um, but we think at the very least, like a heavy part of this is just, this is the way these kiddos' brains are wired, and adults' brains are wired. Um, it may get worse in times of anxiety or stress, but it's not like what you often think um, your parents come in with is like just something horrible and traumatic happened to them, and that caused these kids. And that would be very unusual. I, I mean, it, it wouldn't be able to do that alone. Not that ticks can't be controlled. It's really that the urge to do a tick can't be controlled. Um, and often people aren't aware of this premonitory urge when they come into treatment um, because the space between the urge and the tick is often so automatic that they may not be like thinking about it or even aware that they have this urge. So the whole thing feels very quick and very automatic and very involuntary. Um, so actually a funny anecdote about this, I typically treat kids in adolescence, as you know, but one time I had this guy who was probably in his like uh, late 60s, early 70s come in for an intake. Um, and the way, I think I was a postdoc at the time, so you know, we like always have a licensed psychologist to check in with. So I did the whole intake and I asked him about the urge. He, he'd had ticks his whole life, but hadn't really been kind of even aware of his ticks until pretty recently. Um, and he's like, no, I don't have an urge. They just happen. He is having like, historically, he'd always had blinks and nose twitches. And then more recently, he was having a, a, a phonic tick that was really bothering him. Um, and so I, we did the whole evaluation and he was waiting in the waiting room while I was checking in. And then he came back in and he was like, I found the urge. I found the urge. And he realized he'd always had it. He just hadn't been aware of it until it happened in the waiting room. Um, so that urge is involuntary. Like that just comes out of nowhere. Um, but what isn't involuntary is the actual tick, and that's the whole basis for our treatment. Not only can you suppress it, and it's not involuntary, but that suppressing it leads to less reinforcement of that cycle and eventually less. Okay, so I will leave it there. Um, and just some takeaways from this lecture on ticks and body focused repetitive behavior disorders. So these are even though these are actually in different parts of the DSM, so ticks are considered a neurodevelopmental disorder, body-focused repetitive behavior disorders are considered to be more related to OCD. These disorders have a lot of similarities and a lot of overlap. So important to remember though is that they're both standalone disorders. They're not caused by anxiety disorders. They're not self-injurious behaviors. Um, they may be exacerbated by stress and anxiety, but that's true of most forms of psychopathology. Both Ticks and body-focused repetitive behavior disorders are related to OCD and its spectrum disorders. So if someone has one of these disorders, if someone has OCD, they're more likely than the general population to also have ticks and trichotillomania. Uh, relatedly, if someone has ticks or trichotillomania, they're much more likely than the general population to have OCD. Of the two, body-focused repetitive behavior disorders and ticks, body-focused repetitive behavior disorders, not just trick are more strongly related to depression and anxiety. And there's some evidence that this relationship goes both ways, where pulling and picking precedes the development of anxiety or depression. There is a lot of social impairment 
intake disorders, but partly because this tends to be younger kids who have it and um, like quote unquote weird or odd behavior is just maybe more acceptable in elementary school than it is in high school. Also, these are more likely to be boys that have it and there might be less policing of boys like behavior and self presentation. Um, many patients with tick disorders don't aren't bothered by it don't experience a lot of impairment and distress and that's really different than hair pulling and skin picking. Uh, these behaviors tend to be really distressing and that's a lot of that is because of the, the physical damage they cause there's like physical evidence that you did this. Um, whereas ticks it's really just like sneezing or clearing your throat it just is done to get rid of an uncomfortable feeling. Um, both ticks and body focused repetitive behavior disorders are very highly heritable. Um, the environment doesn't do a lot to cause these disorders. Um, I didn't give you a heritability estimate for this lecture. That's actually because these disorders are fairly under researched and we don't really have a great understanding of the exact heritability. But what we know is that there's really no environmental circumstance that will cause these disorders in the absence of a lot of genetic and biological risk. Both ticks and body focused repetitive behavior disorders have a childhood onset. The onset for ticks is much younger, usually between four and six, whereas the onset for hair pulling and skin picking is between 14 and 18, typically, 14 and 19. Um, both ticks and body focused repetitive behaviors can cause physical problems. Body focused repetitive behaviors, by definition, cause visible damage, um, but they can also cause long term damage like scarring, alopecia, potential digestive problems. And tick disorders can cause long term muscle and joint problems from the repetitive wear and tear. The treatment for these disorders is the same. They both respond to habit reversal training with a focus on eliminating negative reinforcement by breaking the cycle where doing the tick or engaging in hair pulling or skin picking is the only way that the person knows how to get through that urge. Um, there's more of an element of positive reinforcement to think about in body focused repetitive behavior disorders, which is why we so often use replacement behaviors as part of treatment. So things that satisfy the urge, but not as much and not in the same way. All right, um, so that's the end. I might try to add some additional further readings before um, I post these lecture slides, but possibly not. Um, so that's that. I will see you guys in class.